And, I mean, one of the things that fascinates me and I think is sort of crucial here and elsewhere is the odd state of public opinion and perception. And I, I think it, the issue of climate change is an issue which people both care about deeply and yet in a way not deeply enough, or an issue where people know and don't know simultaneously or something. I just wondered if you would have picked up a lot about the mood of the country, the mood of public opinion. And what your, I mean, for example, I, you know, James Hansen, who we, we now know we both admire, recently wrote a letter to dear Mr. Rudd saying something like, Australia must stop digging up coal, yeah. which is a typically direct James Hansen kind of statement. And I, I don't think he got a reply, at least I, know, I don't know of it. Um, but um, it seems to me r very radical suggestions of that kind would not, are impossible in Australia now. And I was struck, for example, that both Barack Obama and, and John McCain at least agreed with Al Gore's proposition that America should get off fossil fuels within 10 years. Whereas here, the translation is we should stop digging up and using coal and exporting it would be treated, you'd be treated like a kind of lunatic. So I'm just wondering, I'm trying to come to terms with the failure of public opinion to see the severity. And I just wondered mm. what you'd picked up in your talks and so on. Well, it, it's interesting, I mean, the Australian newspaper <coughs> treated me as a bit of a lunatic and, and tried to actually paint me as someone who wanted to ban coal exports, whereas I have never yes, said right. that, but you know, that was, and I think that you're right, that that, that is the sign of a true lunatic, someone who'd give away $55 billion of exports. Anyway, um, in terms of public opinion and, and the public view, what I think I've learned as I travelled around Australia is that the public have, as taken as a whole, it's a bit like at election time, they have an unerring sense of what's right in these issues. They may not know the details, they may be expressing it in odd ways, they may be dealing with it, but there is a deep sense of unease in Australia about this. Um, and it, it is partly, I think, due to the fact that we're a long-lived species and we can see changes, partly that we're fairly scientifically literate, um, but there is a sense that, that this, is not, this is not good, what's mm. happening is not good, and we know as well that we're guilty, and maybe that's the good answer. You, would you judge that if a government was radical in the area, much more, ra you know, you suggest, what is the price of a tonne of carbon dioxide, I think you say it should be $80 yeah, a yeah, ton in yeah. the essay. So let's say the Rudd government decided to agree with you. Do you think that the state of public opinion is that they would accept something as radical as that even? To be absolutely honest with you, mm. I think the public would accept it. I think the unions would go bonkers. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them, and some industries would go bonkers. And I, I just think that governments these days rarely stand up to, to those sort of pressures. Um, it would help a lot if Malcolm Turnbull would uh, decide to do a David Cameron and to try to bring the Conservative Party in Australia into the green fold as David Cameron has with great success. Um, and that way he could almost outflank the government. I suppose the view is there's still enough Neanderthals in the climate area left on that side of politics that he hasn't got a hope of doing that. Yes. I hope he does. I think that his, his personal views would be that that would be a good thing to do, but the party simply isn't ready for yes. it. Um, so. I, I do think the public as a whole would, st would stand by it. Eighty dollars, yes, you'd get some social issues, particularly for people at the at the, the most disadvantaged yeah. end. But you, the thing you've got to realise is you're actually making a, a heap of money with yeah. that too, and you if uh, sensibly apply that money to alleviate any adverse consequences. Yeah. Um, but you know you, what you're doing at that stage is closing down in the near term almost all the coal-fired power plants in, in Australia and we saw what happened to Maurice Yemmer who just tried to privatise them in New South yeah. Wales. Um, so difficult. Extremely now, difficult. I want, I want there to be, I'm, I haven't kept a check on the time but I think we have a few more minutes um, and then I think we should open up to questions if, if we can. But I wanted to, um, there's a sort of kind of, um, there are two sentences in your essay which I'd like to pull together. Um, one comes from the very beginning and one comes from the end and then um, I'd like to see how they, they fit. Um, right at the beginning, you speak, you're talking about James Lovelock and you speak, you're speaking with, um, you know, giving a, a very uh, powerful account of Gaia. 
And then you say, a very, perhaps the most important sentence in the quarterly essay, uh, in shortened version, this generation is destined to achieve an extraordinary transformation, one unique in the billion year, sorry, the four billion year history of Earth. You go on where we can be saved by the human intelligence which regulates and will regulate processes of the Earth so that in a way we become part of Gaia but the, the brain of Gaia or whatever. Is it? Um, then at, at the end of the essay, um, you speak with what, what I would call sober fear. Um, there is a better than even chance that despite our best efforts, in the coming two or three decades, the Earth's, or Earth's climate system will pass the point of no return. Um, and clearly, I mean all of us, I think, who finally get into this area um, a, a balance somehow between those mm. two possibilities. Mm. I mean, my, my sort of, my, my trouble with the essay, the, my only trouble with it actually, because I think it's a splendid essay, is that I'm a person who thinks about politics and international relations. Mm. And so for that, for human intelligence to take charge, as it must, there is all this, this sort of intermediate mess that we call domestic or national politics mm -hmm. and international affairs. And I, I have to say, my observation of domestic politics and international affairs is the astonishing incapacity thus far, mm -hmm. either of nation states, with the exception of some Europeans. And actually, I have to say, I, I mentioned the Holocaust, mm -hmm. the most notable exception of Germany, mm -hmm. but the failure of most nation states to rise to this challenge and some like China and India, you know, not only not rising, but, but moving into industrialization on fossil fuels at a terrible rate. But also the sort of incapacity of the international system to, to do what, you know, the new. And, you know, here we have the gods playing a very nasty trick on us. Mm. The very year, when, I know you're involved in Copenhagen, the very year when that crucial year to the history of humanity to negotiate the new Kyoto process. Um, we have this financial crisis in which all national governments are going to be preoccupied. And, and so I, suppose, I, mean, I know you're not, this is not your field, but I'm, you know, mm. you're a man of intuition. And so your gut instinct is that you think somehow we can transcend the sort of national egoism and the international inertia um, that will allow us, our intelligence somehow to save us. Look, I, Robert, I, I take a long view of these sort of things, and, and you know, if you think back to the time of Plato, you know, who was where Gaia, this idea, yes. originated. At that time, people were, everyone was very close to agriculture and close to the world as a living system, because we hadn't, didn't have big cities and things, but we were all close to it. And at that stage, we all intuitively understood that the Earth has its workings, it's a living, breathing planet, you know. And ever since that time, or ever since the Middle Ages anyway, we've been a species in transition. We've been living in larger and larger cities. We've developed more sophisticated technology. And our politics has slowly caught up. We, we, you know, back in Plato's time, the clan was the defining unit. You know? And we've since built from, on that from clans to nations to allegiances of nations such as the European Union. And so we're in a, we're in a period of transition. Um, and Ultimately, this transition, we can see where it's going to lead. It will lead to a world coordinated response of some sort. It already has on one occasion with the Montreal Protocol. You know, mm. The question really is, can our systems evolve swiftly Quick enough, enough yeah. to meet this challenge? And that's a, a, the jury is still out with that, I think. Um, we, will, we will have to see how that, how that plays out. And I don't think anyone can honestly answer that. All I can say is that I'm uh, hopeful that we will get a, a sufficient treaty uh, out of Copenhagen, or if not, then maybe it'll be the year after in Washington, and it'll be the Washington Protocol. Maybe that's the price we need to pay to have the Americans <laughs> on board. Whatever it is, we, we you know, um, I, I remain optimistic that we will do that. But we individually are intelligent. We we have all of the tools we need to deal with the problem. What we need is simply a uh, coordinated will to exert those tools to make a difference and that's what's lacking and we are that far from it because we now have a United Nations we now have super national organizations we understand them we are we are very close to that point where we could have that um, whether we'll get there in time I don't know um, I think it would be time for questions
in uh, 10 years shop time, China will have installed enough power stations to provide the same amount of power per head of population as what we've got in Australia. Um, now given that globally not one light bulb is powered by clean coal carbon capture and storage, and that the leading proponents say that it will, it will be uh, 15 to 20 years before we get a clean coal carbon capture and storage site, why do you advocate that technology given that China won't be installing a thousand megawatts per week anymore in 10 years' time, once they reach our level of industrialisation in 10 years' time? Sure. Look, the reason that I think clean coal technologies are important is that um, the number of, of new coal-fired power plants, particularly in China, is so large that we can't effectively address the problem while those power plants are in existence. Because they're brand new and they represent a massive investment, the Chinese government isn't going to walk away from them. And they will become a sticking point in any global negotiation unless we can hold out some hope that they can somehow either be retrofitted or if they can't be retrofitted, then perhaps the government would countenance the idea of closing them down. The industry itself has been very duplicitous, the coal industry in the area of clean coal. What they have set up as the sort of benchmark or the achievement is what's called integrated gasification combined cycle burning of coal and, and, and sequestration. And that's sort of the Rolls-Royce approach to the thing. And I think that's been quite a deliberate approach by the coal industry to say, let's set up the Rolls-Royce model as the goal because that puts it far enough into the future we don't need to worry about it much. There are actually other carbon capture and storage technologies like Calide, CS Calide uh, technology, which is being applied up in Queensland, uh, which are much more uh, cost effective and simple to do. And I think that unless we give that a go, unless we can try to uh, deal with that liability of particularly those, those Chinese coal-fired power plants, uh, unless we at least make an attempt, the Chinese government will never agree to decommission them before they're used by date. And that's what we must do. We must either decommission or retrofit in the next 20 years. Look, there's nothing in the natural situation that seems to account for the extraordinarily rapid melting of the Arctic ice. Um, the, the sunspot activity, doesn't seem uh, to be correlated and, and have a meaningful impact. Um, there's no volcanic activity or anything else that seems to be doing it. The one factor that that is uh, that people are still looking at is uh, the small ca particulate carbon pollution, particularly the sort of stuff you get when you burn diesel or you know or from coal-fired power plants. And that very light and small particulate plume, if it blows over the Arctic ice and darkens the ice just fractionally it'll tend to capture more of the sun's energy as heat and therefore accelerate the melting. No one knows whether that is a significant factor or not, but what we can say at the moment is that the real world data is running well ahead of any modelling that we can do. So we know the model's wrong, we can't understand why it's wrong. But it is quite alarming, and I mean, I keep on hoping that we'll get a, a year when the ice grows back, you know? But there is no sign of that now, and we're so close to that point where, you know, there, there will be no more ice that it's hard to know what to do. And of course, at that point, it's unlikely the ice will then grow back because the, the, the surface of the ocean is dark and uh, it captures a lot of energy and turns it into heat energy, and that impedes new ice formation. And you know, you basically, it's hard to imagine at that point the situation turning back. I, that's, that's quite right, and that is in fact what a lot of governments are suggesting we do, is adapt. They talk about adaptation uh, to these circumstances. And I have a couple of problems just from my practical life experience in terms of doing that. The first is that there is enormous uncertainty as to how this will actually play out. We don't really know, how, how this, you know what will happen when we reach that tipping point. We have some idea that sea level will rise, and probably rise quite abruptly. We don't know how much. And you know, I was asked, just in terms of adaptation, when I was in South Australia, the, I was head of the Premier Science Council, and a developer came along and was presenting plans to cabinet to develop the port area. They were very proud, saying that they'd left a 20 centimetre sort of leeway for a rise in sea level, and you know that, that was great. But back then, in 2001, that was what people were suggesting over the century, maybe 20 centimetres, something like that, you know. We now know maybe it's 90 centimetres, and that's without including sea ice collapse. Oh, sorry, land ice collapse. So it is really hard to know what you're adapting to. The other 
point that I think we need to be really clear about on this is that, let's take one scenario, let's imagine that we get a two metre sea level rise sometime this century and an abrupt one. That would displace about 600 million people globally. It would drown some of the major cities of the planet, it would cost us um, uh, some of our best agricultural land. And imagine if that happens in a few months or even a few years. Imagine a dislocation that would cause and the political stresses that will put on a system where people need to cooperate to, to solve the problem. And I, I think that it's, it's much like September 11th, you know, the, the downing of the Twin Towers was horrendous, but the real damage was done by the sort of immune reaction of the American people to that assault. And in some ways, the collapse of the ice shelves, the damage will be done by our own political I instincts, I think, which will be to try to uh, grab as many resources as we can in a time of stress. You know? When resources are, are scarce, people tend to fight over them. And that's the big danger to me. And I don't know how you pre-prepare a world for that. Tim, in your essay, you don't talk about individual agency, solar power, on your roof, um, buying cheap energy, etc. I just wonder whether you think that's an important part of the solution or whether it's a potential distraction from government action, which is the most important thing. And I also wanted to ask you, if we do solve the problem, what do you think the world will look like? Um, you know, what will our cities look like and what will the, you know... Well, that's a great question. <laughs> the, the, the first part is, I do think it's obviously very important. I didn't want to focus uh, on the essay on it because, for a start, I, I wrote the essay for an Australian audience and I believe that most Australians recognise the nature of the problem and are increasingly becoming proactive. The great value in individuals doing something, by the way, is not just the difference they make to their energy consumption, it's the leadership they show in doing that. And that's what is so it's very politically potent and socially potent and it starts causing the sort of changes that we'll need to see if we're to get through this, this problem. So I do think it's important, but it wasn't necessarily the focus of the essay. What do I think Australia will be like, when, um, or, or the world? Um, we will have to have some sort of global control over carbon. And that means, it, see, it changes everything, in a sense. Just as, you know, the economic crisis has changed things, hasn't it? For the first time, we've had world bankers get together, you know, reserve banks of the world get together to discuss the problem. We're starting to revisit the Bretton Woods agreements and those sort of things. The climate crisis has the potential to do the same sort of thing. But carbon is all pervasive. You and I are 18% carbon. Carbon is in everything. It is, it's the, it's the sort of currency of Gaia. It's what goes between the atmosphere, the living world, the oceans and the crust and is co constantly passed between the three principal organs of Gaia. So dealing with that in an intelligent way will take a comprehensive understanding of what the planet's actually about. And what will happen in the end is that we will be the custodians of life on Earth in a, in a real sense, not in a sense that we are at the moment or the way the Bible gives you lordship over the planet, but in a sense we'll actually have to be an active part of this very active planet, active management of the planet. And it, it, Earth swims or sinks altogether. It's not like you can just act for your own self-interest in that. So I think we face a really different and very interesting future if we can get through this crisis. Yeah, sure. That, at, at the end of the last ice age, um, when um, the ice shelf started breaking up, we saw exactly that. We went from a period of, of re relatively stably cold climate to a very erratic climate where there was freezes and thaws on hundreds of years or millennia long cycles. And that gradually decreased or came to a point where we had a stable climate again. Um, no one knows whether that will occur as, we, as the melting proceeds this time, but there's every chance it will. So we may have a regional freezing of Europe, for example, as a result of that while the rest of the world cooks, because the heat has to go somewhere. It's going to come to the Southern Hemisphere or wherever else. So we can't really predict how that's going to play out, but the one thing we can, we can say is the chances of greater climatic uh, variability in extremes is certainly a very real one. I, I, I genuinely think that the world, this, this global economic crisis has been a very salutary lesson for humanity. It's taught us a lot. First of all, it's taught us that stability isn't, you shouldn't ever take it for granted. 
that once systems start to change, they change systemically often, and there are changes that you couldn't even imagine in, tr in, in track. So that's a, that's a good thing to know. It's a good thing to know that we can cooperate at a global level to try to do something about it. It's a good thing to know that regulation's important. You know, so a well-regulated marketplace, I think, is, is not a bad thing. My, that's my personal view, you know, that, that that's probably the way we need to go. And if you think about it, if the marketplace was unregulated, you and I could still own other human beings, you know, right? Fully unregulated. So regulation's important. Um, and the other thing it's taught us is to look at the capital, you know. We see that the capital has dried up, credit's dried up in the current economic crisis. As I look at the, the ice melting, I realise that, you know, if we do have a reserve bank of climate, it is the world's ice. And that ice has preserved coldness since the last ice age. Some of that ice is 20,000 years old. And as you see the sort of fungible bit of that capital disappearing, you've got to worry that we, you know, that this, this is not a healthy situation. So I think it's taught us a few things. I don't see an alternative model to capitalism, well-regulated capitalism. I hope maybe there'll be one out there one day. But I think that we can start seeing the glimmerings of a a new world where, where people will accept the need for regulation. And that regulation in, in my area of environment really just means that, you know, uh, obey the Eighth Commandment, you know, look after the future generation. They shall not steal, you know, from the future. Basically is what it's about. Well, you'd have to regulate it to say, you know, they shall not steal from the future. That's a, yeah. Well, look, the reason that I concentrate on carbon capture and storage as being important is the liability that's represented by that. It will be a million megawatts of, of new coal-fired power capacity in China in a, in a decade's time. Right? And there's, you can't, the Chinese will not walk away from that investment. They don't have the money or the expertise to develop carbon capture and storage themselves. Uh, that's going to have to be done outside and transferred in through a clean development mechanism. Um, I agree with you that, that in the US, particularly in the southwest, solar thermal is the way to go. In Australia, geothermal, wind and everything else is important. But there, are, there is an underlying problem in that, that Chinese investment. And I should say the coal industry was very active in trying to help the Chinese make that decision to build all that coal-fired power capacity. Um, but my suggestion is not that we throw more public money after this. I think that the Rudd government's been very generous putting $600 million of your and my money into this. Uh, and the companies themselves have put almost nothing meaningful in. Um, we, you know, they, the, the profits this year from coal exports will be $55 billion, a 10% impost on that, so taking 10% of those gains and reinvesting it in the industry's future would give you a very potent war chest to make sure that we could develop carbon capture and storage technologies in Australia and transfer them to China at the earliest opportunity. So that's what I'm suggesting. And not the Rolls-Royce version, not IGCC and all this sort of stuff, but the sort of things that look to be cost effective that might add $30 you know, per megawatt hour for cost um, that are being developed in Australia right now, which are applicable and in 20 years time could be retrofitted to a lot of existing power plants. And I dis could I just say I disagree with you that the, this is a failed technology. We don't know yet, but I personally think that some of the um, more practical approaches are, a are actually rather promising. Well, look, it, it's a very interesting question in terms of the global treaty because we're in a situation at the moment where the developing, rapidly developing countries, um, you know, the BRIC countries, they call them, Brazil, India, China, and Indonesia. Who, who's the next one? I forget. Russia. Russia, yeah, sorry. Um, are going, they've got enormous energy demands, and those, those energy demands are such that it's, it's just not feasible to require um, reductions of emissions from them at the moment. So the, the sort of shape of the treaty that I think will uh, evolve is that the developed world will take on voluntary cuts on the understanding that at a certain point in time, and it might be the moment when per capita emissions in the BRIC countries reach 30% or 50% of the average for the developed world, uh, at that moment in time, the BRIC countries will take on an obligation to reduce. And then we'll have what's called contraction and convergence, which will be a per capita based thing, where we look at 
our, um, our per capita thing gets down to zero at some indeterminate point in the future. So the sort of, you know, in Australia, I, I forget what the intensity is now. Um, I've got a horrible feeling it's 18 or 19 tonnes a person or something like that. That would have to start dropping pretty immediately, um, or not immediately, in the next decade. And then at some point, perhaps 2020, 2030, the big countries would come on board and we'd then start reducing beyond that. Now, that's what the political reality dictates. What I can tell you was someone who studied the climate system is that that's going to be inadequate to deal with the problem. Yeah? So that, and in, a, in a way, that's why the key message of the SA is that emissions reductions are critically important and the carbon pollution reduction scheme is critically important, but it will not save us. It's necessary but not sufficient. And the other things that are required are using the force, the life force of our planet to draw the pollution out of the atmosphere, to use our agriculture and our forestry and our grazing practices to make sure that we buy ourselves enough time to allow that model for a treaty, a global treaty, to be effective. I uh, will take one more question from the front. Um, Tim, a couple of years ago in the AU, you were saying that if the Arctic sea ice went, then we might see a 10 degrees regional temperature rise in the polar north, which is unfortunately true. And we now have data this year saying that people think that's about the level that the permafrost will start to go quickly and seriously. Given that the sea ice could go, as you're saying, the next five years, and therefore we're going to press the permafrost button rather than years quicker than we thought we would. Can we afford to wait to see if clean coal works? I guess it's, it's the time question. I mean, you said earlier it was sort of urgent and pressing. I mean, can we afford to bet on this technology maybe working two decades' time and the problem is absolutely now? Can I just say to you that um, some of you may have seen a report in the newspapers in um, late September this year about a release of methane in the Arctic Ocean. I don't know whether you saw that. Um, and that, that, initially I sort of dismissed it and I've thought about it and it's gnawed away at me since and I do worry about it. It's, um, it happened in the last week of the melt season. It's the sort of thing you'd expect to see you know, where methane's actually reaching the surface of the ocean, not carbon dioxide, so it's not being oxidised. It's obviously coming up in large volume. Um, and I will watch with great interest um, what happens this coming summer in the Arctic. So I don't know uh, how close we are to pushing the methane button. Um, I do know that no technology in the world can save us if, if that, that starts happening. I mean, the only resort then is to put sulphur in the stratosphere in the northern hemisphere and hope to cool it enough that you'll get some sort of impact. Uh, that's sort of the last resort. That's like the, the radical surgery, chop off the limb to save the patient, you know. Um, clean coal technologies, as I've tried to explain, the, the industry has misled us all, I believe, by suggesting that there's this Rolls-Royce model that we, that's what we have to achieve called IGCC and, and geosequestration. I don't think that's true. I think there are other technologies that are, um, and I, I just suggest that you go online and have a look at some of the other options that are happening in, in Australia and elsewhere that are simpler, more cost effective, and more immediately applicable if the funding were there to do it, immediately fitable. Uh, that particularly in the case of China may give us a way out of this, you know, as, as Ross Garno says, diabolical dilemma. You know, who, if you can tell me how we can convince the Chinese government to walk away from a million megawatts worth of brand new coal-fired power plants. I'll do whatever, I'll, I'll agree with you, whatever it is. But, but that is, it's the problem, we, you know. I, I just cannot conceive of how we can do that. Yet unless we can clean up or decommission those power plants, we cannot save the planet. Can I have 20 seconds to answer that? Yeah. If the West can spend $4 billion bailing out bad bank managers, Perhaps we can spend $4 trillion buying the Chinese a new power system. Well, well, how long would that take? Where would we get the technologies in China? What would actually work in China? You know, they are going... Would, it's, not, it's not really. It's, it's not only political will. Political will is a very important part of it. But the Chinese government at the moment is going as fast as they can to build new nuclear power, for example. And they're going from 1% of their, um, their, their energy from nuclear to 3% in 2020. And that's pulling out all stops. China's not like Australia, it doesn't have the thermal, it doesn't have the sunlight or the wind reserves. It has some, but you know, you're dealing with 1.3 billion people there. It's, 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 a, it's a really difficult dilemma when you've got short timelines to solve those sort of problems. And I, I freely admit carbon capture and storage is, is risky. We don't know whether it's going to work. We don't know the full expense of it. But I'm struggling to find another way forward. So that is, uh, in the north of China, 
I, you've got to have really good quality insulation to make that work. And I, I just don't think that China's, I don't, well, I mean, mate, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I don't think the reserve is there on scale to do it. That's all we've got time for tonight. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you also to Tim Flannery and Robert Mann for such an insightful discussion. Um, it's been fantastic.